Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. We kind of took a break from Romans there for a couple of weeks. Uh, but we're back. But we're close to the end of the first section of Romans. Okay? Uh, when we get to the end of chapter 3, basically that, that ends the first section of Romans. And, and just to kind of recap what Paul has told us about in the first two chapters and up to this point in chapter 3, there are basically three things we've been told, okay? Number one, we are accountable to God for what we have done. Or maybe a better way to put it is we are accountable to God for what we've not done. Either way, we are accountable to God. We're accountable to God. Number two is we are guilty of wrongdoing. Paul made it very clear. It doesn't matter who we are, what kind of affiliation we have, or what kind of life we have been living. In our sinful state, we are guilty before God. Okay? And there's no excusing that, and there's no getting out of that. And number three is we're not justified just because we do good works. Stop and think about it. People say that I, you know, God's going to take into consideration my good works. In your natural state, can you do good works? No, you can't. You might live, uh, you might live a morally correct life, I guess. You might even think the right way in some areas. But in your sinful state as a human being without Christ, you're incapable of doing good works. And you know, I, I hope all of this makes sense this morning. I'm going to try to tie it all together. But I'm going to stop right there for a minute and tell you about some things. That, you know, I, I never cease to be amazed. And, and I've gotten to where I look at some headlines every now and then. Uh, and Josh pointed one out to me. One of them I'm not even going to tell you about it's just too graphic, okay? Just too graphic. Other than to say, there are some really depraved people in this world, okay? Uh, and, it, and it's what was said that alarms me the most. I say that. I think I may be alarmed more. Uh, this was said at a town hall meeting uh, that was held by one of our New York senators. Uh, and I can't, I, don't, I can't remember what her name is, but it, 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 in the news I always just say AOC. I guess that's her initials. Maybe what alarmed me worse than anything was these comments that were made that were so barbaric that I can't even mention them here in this pulpit. But what alarmed me most was she didn't condemn them right then. That's very telling to me. Okay, but the other story hits closer to home. Josh and I were sitting there the other morning. He actually pointed this out, and and I'm sure Cole knows what I'm talking about. There is a, a website out there called Police One, and Police One it just talks about mainly police issues and things that are going on around the country within the law enforcement community. And I still look at it. I hadn't looked at it in a couple of days, but there is a story <laughs> on Police One. Uh, about a lawsuit that's taking place between a, uh, a county deputy and the county, not far from here. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Now, let me tell you what this lawsuit is over. <clears throat> and, and I know this person. I've been knowing this person. This person is suing the county because the county health insurance will not pay yet for gender reassignment surgery. Now, we hear about this kind of thing all the time, okay? But one of the comments, because on this website, police who are, or, or law enforcement officers can, can you know, make comments about certain, art, you know, the articles that are on this website. And what really got me was Josh was looking at this, and he was telling me about this story, which we're familiar with, and, and uh, 
and he's reading some of the comments, and thank goodness most of the comments from police officers are saying, really, get over it, next subject, let's go. Just keep it moving, you know, kind of like traffic cops, just keep it moving. But there was one person that got on there, and this is what took my breath away. There was one person that got on there and said they should pay for it, and not only that, God made a mistake and put her in a man's body. Amen. Uh, man. God made a mistake? No. Now you know what? And I'm going to try to keep this pretty close to time. People say a lot of things on this earth. But based on what Paul has told us so far in Romans and what he is telling us right here in the verse that I'm fixing to read, which is chapter 3 and verse 19. In fact, let's go ahead and read it. Paul says, Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law. Now here's the part I want, I want to key on right here. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. People, let me tell you something. People can say what they want to about God right now, but rest assured, based on what Paul has told us so far, one day those same people, just like all of us, are going to stand before God. And you know what? We're not going to be able to say a word. Amen. Father, I pray. Help us this morning. Father, I pray that you would teach us more than that. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would move our hearts. That, Father, you would work in a very special way. Heavenly Father, I just ask that your will would be done. In your name we pray. Amen. You may have heard of Donald Gray Barnhouse. Donald Gray Barnhouse, he was a Presbyterian preacher, but he also, I mean, he pastored a church, but he was also a tremendous speaker. He wrote volumes of commentaries and things like that on the Word of God. He traveled all over the world and was a great speaker and led thousands and thousands of people to Christ. But his, his tactic when talking to somebody, when he would get to talking to them and get to know them a little bit, he would ask them, are you a Christian? And he basically was asking a diagnostic question, if you, so, if you will. Basically, he was saying, are you a Christian? Well, have you ever done that? Have you ever talked to somebody and said, are you a Christian? It's amazing what kind of answers you come up with. You come up with all kinds of answers, don't you? People will say, yes, I'm a Christian. In which case, what do we normally do? Really, tell me about it. Well, you know what? You may find out. See, this is where the diagnostics start right here. Because you may find out that they profess to be a Christian, but they're really not. You know, I, I appreciate every one of you being here this morning. But you know what? There's a lot of people out there that confess to be Christians that never darken those doors right back here. You know, I asked a question not long ago. I said, what is, what, you know, do you have a vision for Union Baptist Church? I do. I, I, and, and uh, you know, do you have a vision for Union Baptist Church? And what is that vision? <laughs> And after, after that message, uh, one of the members came up to me and said, you know what my vision for union is? And I said, what's that? He said, for everybody that says they're a member of this church to come to church. Amen. That's a good vision. It's a good vision to be here. Folks, let me tell you something. We have to have a vision. We have to have. But you're talking to these people about, are you a Christian? And they might say yes. Some of them might say no. But more than likely, what you're going to hear is something to the effect of, well, this is what I do. Okay? Well, then they're going to start talking about all the good things they do. Now, remember, we've already found out that in their sinful state, there's nothing good you can do. All right? 
But here's the thing. Donald Barnhouse would follow up this question, are you a Christian, with this question. And this is the one that really hits at the heart. He said, if you were to die tomorrow, or today even, and folks, let me tell you something. None of us is promised next hour. None of Look, we could be gone. Look, I hope, I'm like my daddy. I hope I live to be 100, get real sick, get real well, and live another 100 years. I mean, I do. You know what? My daddy didn't quite make it. He was 83 when he went to be with the Lord. But let me tell you, I hope I live a long time. I'm enjoying life right now. And I want to keep enjoying it. And I'm thankful for every minute God gives me. But folks, I might not make it home this morning. And it's that way with all of us. And Donald Barnhouse would look at these people and ask this question. If you were to stand before God in the next five minutes and God were to look at you and say, what right do you have to come into my heaven? What would your answer be? Boy, that's a pretty good question right there. Isn't it? That really gets to the heart of the matter. That takes all of everything else out of the picture. It's plain, it's simple, it's easy to understand. What right does God or do you have for God to let you into heaven? What right do you have to get into heaven? And you know what? Basically, there's three answers. Stop thinking about it. You can give three answers, right? You know, the first one is the one I just talked about, good works. Everybody's going to talk about what good works they've had. I mean, you talk to some people, well, I give this much money to the church every year, so what? You know what? I give, I give so much money to charity every year, so what? Well, I go out and I'm a member of this organization that does this for people. And you know what? That's good. If it's an organization that's helping people and using the money it's raised to help people, okay. I have no problem with that. But that won't get you into heaven and it don't get you the right to be in heaven. You did, I, I read a story one time about a preacher who uh, there was a man that lived near his church and, and the preacher was out and then he met this man. First time he'd ever met him. And he started talking to him and said, are you a Christian? And the man said, well, I do this. I'm a member of this organization over here. We do this, 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 and this. And he said, that ain't what I asked you. I asked you, are you a Christian? Hey, let me ask you another question. What right do you have to get into heaven? And this guy just talked about this organization and everything he did and all the good works that they did. And, and he was basing everything on. He even told the preacher one time, you know what? I just think that God takes that into consideration. I think that's enough to get me into heaven because I'm a member of this organization. Well, time rocked on. Years rocked on. That preacher kept witnessing to that man. And you know what? Years and years later, that preacher had been after him all this time. man got really sick. And the doctors told him he was going to die. And he was in the hospital and he was really sick. And you know what? Other members of that organization were there with this man. And that preacher walked into that hospital room knowing that it wasn't going to be long before this man went to eternity. And you know what? That preacher prayed about it and prayed about it and he thought, you know what? All this time I have been talking to this man and I tried to be nice to him. He said, I'm going to try something a little bit different. I'm going to try a new tactic. And he walked in there and to the rest of the people in the room, he said, I am so-and-so, I am the pastor at this church, I have known this man for a long time, and I would like to know, will you allow me to stay in here because I want to see what it's like to watch a man die without Jesus Christ? And that sick man on the bed looked at that preacher and said, are you mocking me? He said, no, I just want to see what it's like to watch somebody die without Christ. What right do you have to be in heaven? And for the first time in years, the man couldn't answer. He was silenced. And the story was told that tears began to run down his face. And the preacher said, you don't have to die without Christ. That's what I've been telling you all these years. There's still time, but rest assured, you're not going to be here much longer. And if you die without Christ, you're lost for eternity. And miraculously, God got a hold of that man's heart and he accepted Christ. And he died the next day. <coughs> Folks, let me tell you something. There'll come a time 
you know, we make all kinds of excuses here. We can jump up and down and say it wasn't my fault and that ain't who I am and blah, blah, blah. But let me tell you something. One of these days, we're all going to stand before God. And when God asks us what right do we have to get into heaven, we're going to be silenced. We won't be able to say a word. Folks, let me tell you something. Good works won't get you into heaven. <laughs> the other response is that we won't have anything to say. Nothing to say. That same preacher said he was witnessing to a, a lady who was a teacher at one of the colleges, and he asked her the same question. What right do you have to enter into heaven? What would you say if God looked at you and said, what right do you have to enter into heaven? And you know what she said? She gave a pretty good answer. She said, I would have nothing to say. But I said, you know what? We're getting close to the right answer. We're not there yet, but we're getting closer. You know what? We're going to stand before God. And the Bible says that God is a righteous judge. He's a perfect judge. He is just. He doesn't make mistakes. Now see, in this country, we have courts, don't we? And, and believe me, I still think we have the greatest justice system in the world, although it's flawed. Okay? It does make mistakes sometimes. You know, we... When we, have a, when we are charged with a crime or something, we go before a judge, right? We, we have courts that we go to, and we have the right in this country to be judged by a jury of our peers. <coughs> well, let me tell you something about that, okay? You remember I said we got a good system, it ain't a perfect system, because it's not. All right, we have the right to go to court, we have the right to be judged by a jury of our peers, but stop and think about it. That jury is made up of what? Human beings. Human beings are flawed. You know what? I, that jury of our peers, they're imperfect just like we are. And you know what? Sometimes they make mistakes. <coughs> Sometimes they excuse terrible deeds just because, oh, well. You know, I, I've never ceased to be amazed. I'm sure, you know, that we got the several law enforcement people in here today. I, I'm sure that y'all have heard this, I, and, and most of y'all have probably heard about it. You know what one of the worst defenses, I, defenses in court I've ever heard of? I say it was worst. It got them acquitted, but I couldn't believe it when I heard it. And it has become known as the Twinkie defense. Oh, Twinkie, that's right. I know you know. You know what Twinkie is? You know, they taste real good. You know, they loaded with sugar, which means, you know, if my sugar goes real low, I could eat a Twinkie. <laughs> a couple Sunday mornings ago, I could have used one. But listen, you know what? This guy was charged with murder. Murder! He killed somebody! And he got arrested, and he got taken to court, and he, he, his defense attorney argued successfully, I might add, that he ate Twinkies all the time. He didn't eat good food. He ate Twinkies, and because of all the sugar he had taken in, it caused a chemical imbalance in his brain and in his body, and he could not be held accountable for what he did. And the jury said, yep, not guilty. You think juries are perfect? No. one of the worst miscarriages of justice in the history of our nation was the trial of James Orenthal Simpson. Orenthal James, O.J. Y'all remember that? What a debacle that was. Hard, factual evidence the man was guilty. But he was acquitted by a jury of his peers. You know why? Because they're imperfect. They make mistakes. Sometimes they make a mistake on purpose. Sometimes they do it just because they feel like we don't want to convict him, even though we know he's guilty. And you know what? We can jump up and down and we can have these crazy defenses and we can do all this all we want to in our courts. You know what? And I was really hoping Sean would be here because I might have picked on him a little bit, but I won't since he's not here. I'll wait till he's here. Well, maybe I will. But anyway, you know what? Judges sometimes make mistakes. And I'm sure he'd probably be the first to admit that. Sometimes judges make mistakes. Sometimes judges get it wrong. 
But you know what? Even if we go to a court in our country under our system of justice and we are charged with a crime, if we don't like the outcome of that trial, if we think the jury or the judge didn't get it right, guess what? We can appeal to the next highest court. And you know what? If we don't like the decision there, we can appeal it to the next highest court all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. Now let me tell you something. We can jump up and down and we can talk about why we shouldn't be held accountable. Folks, let me tell you something. I have heard it till I'm sick in the face. My mama didn't hug me when I was a young and now I can't be held responsible for anything. Oh, get over it. <laughs> Grow up. It's time to put on big boy britches. You know what? I know a lot of people that suffered terribly when they were growing up and they turned out to be really fine people. Because the Bible says, you know, Paul said, he said, look, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I acted like a child, I did everything like a child. But you know what? One day I grew up and became a man and I put away childish things. When you get grown, you make your own choices and you can decide what you're going to be and who you're going to serve. Folks, let me tell you something. We can take it to the next highest court. We can go all we want to, but let me tell you something. When we stand before God, there's not a higher court. You're it. When you stand before God, God is the highest authority that there is. There is no appeal. And you know what? When you stand before God, if you are still in your sin, you won't be able to say a word. He will silence you by His mere presence and the fact that you can't lie to God. You're going to stand there and God's going to look at you and you're going to know that you're guilty and you have absolutely nothing to say. It'll just be over. I want to read some scriptures to you. Real quick, if I can find them all. Job, listen, you remember Job? Huh. You know what I was saying about growing up? <laughs> listen to what God told Job. This ain't the verse I want to read, but I'm gonna, I, just, I, I like this in Job. <laughs> it says, then, then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up your loins now like a man. You know what God was saying? You better brace yourself. Because you, this is what I'm about to tell you is going to get hard. That's what he was telling Job. You remember the story of Job. Job, he was a wealthy man. He was blessed. He was a godly man. He believed in God. He followed God. Okay? And then Satan came to God and said, Look, you've, you've blessed Job. God imagine, but you only do that because he likes you and blah, blah, blah. And, and the Lord said, Well, you know what? You can do anything you want to him but kill him. You can't kill him. Anything else you can do to him. And I bet you that Job will not renounce me. And you know the story. Job lost everything he had. Lost all his world possessions. He lost all of his children and their children. All he had left was his wife. He'd have been better off without her. I mean, read it. You read it. He lost everything. But what did he say? Yet though he slay me, I will trust in him. Job never renounced God. He never gave up on God. And you know what? Even when Job's friends came and tried to get a confession out of him of what terrible deeds he had done to cause God to be this mad at him, folks, God don't work that way, okay? Just want to let you know that. Listen, they were sitting there telling Job, you had to have done something to really make God mad. And Job finally gave up on them. And when it was just Job and God, guess what? Job said, Lord, why is this happening? He didn't understand. And he kept asking God, God, why? God, why? And I don't like the way Job ends because you know what? Let me tell you, you want me to sum it up for you? God said, Job, listen to me now. Go on and put on your big boy pants. Gird up your loins like a man. He said, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I created everything that there is? Job, where were you when I did this and when I did that? Job, is there any way you can make the wind go where it wants to? Job, can you do this? And you know what? Finally, Job had to answer, right? So right here in Job chapter 40, and verses 4 and 5, it says, 
Behold, well, go back to verse 3. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I'm vile. What shall I answer you? He couldn't answer. He was silenced. He said, What shall I answer you? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Folks, when we stand before God, we're going to be kind of like Job. Listen, let me read some others to you real quick. This is a book that you don't, you don't read out of much probably. Habakkuk. Habakkuk 3, 16. i got to get to the right page. 3, 16 says this. When I heard, when I heard, Habakkuk was talking about what he had heard, how, what God had done. He said, when I heard, my belly trembled, my lips Withered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. As he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his truth. Habakkuk said this My insides began to quiver, my lips trembled. But you notice it didn't say anywhere in there where Habakkuk said a word, it just said his lips trembled. He could not speak before God. And in Isaiah, familiar passage of Scripture, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5, And then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of an unclean uh, people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When we see the King of Kings and the Lord of Hosts, and He stands in front of us and says, What right do you have to enter my heaven? We won't be able to say it. We won't be able to say anything. And then there's a third answer. It's the only right answer. Okay? Here's the answer. When God looks you in your eye and he says, what right do you have to come into my heaven? Your only answer can be Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ. Listen, we're never going to get to heaven based on our achievements. We only get to heaven on what Christ has done on the cross of heaven. That's the only way we get to heaven. Look, when we stand before God and He asks what right we have, if we say anything other than the blood of Jesus Christ, we're lost. We're lost. I read another story about a, uh, about a young man years ago. He was a dance instructor for Arthur Murray Dance Studio. Y'all remember that? And uh, he was living a, uh, an ungodly life. And one Saturday night, he had been out with all of his buddies. And he finally, in the wee hours Sunday morning, staggered back to his room and fell into the bed and went to sleep. And sometime the next morning, on Sunday morning, there was a radio play and it woke him up. And as soon as he kind of came to himself and could realize what was going on, the very first words he heard from that radio was a Sunday morning preacher, and it happened to be Donald Barnhouse. And Donald Barnhouse asked this question on the radio. If you were to stand before God today, and he were to ask you, what right do you have to enter into my heaven? What would your answer be? And this hungover, young dance instructor sat there and sat there and sat there and could not think of an answer. He was silent. He was silent. After hours, he remembered stories that people had told him about how Jesus loved him about how Jesus had come to earth 
and died so that he might be saved. And that young dance instructor got on his knees and he asked Jesus Christ to save him and Christ. And that young dance instructor quit being a dance instructor. He decided he wanted to preach. He went to school. That young man's name was Dr. D. James Kennedy, who was at Coral Ridge Baptist Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Folks, let me tell you something about D. James Kennedy if you don't know him. You ever heard of a, an evangelistic tool and course of study called Evangelism Explosion? D. James Kennedy wrote it. D. James Kennedy preached the rest of his life. He's going on to be with Jesus now. Let me tell you something. For the rest of his life, he preached the Word of God. He was a prolific writer, and because of that man's ministry, thousands are now in the kingdom of God. Folks, let me tell you something. It's all because he was silenced. You know what? Part of me gets angry when I hear stuff like, well, God made us. When I heard that, you know what the first thought that popped into my mind was? Be angry and sin not. I said, God, I got the anger part down right, but help me with the not sin. Because right now I'm thinking of stuff that ain't good. Let me tell you something. God didn't make us. But you're making a big if you think you can stand before God and do anything but plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. What right do you have to enter into heaven? What is your answer? Father, I pray. <coughs> I pray. that if there's anyone here this morning that could not answer that question, I pray that today you would speak to them gently, loving them, that you would just draw them unto you so that they might have the answer. And the only correct answer is the blood of Jesus. Father, I pray today that you would help us as Christians to recommit ourselves to telling other people what their answer needs to be. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, bless this time. glorified and that your will would be done. Lord, that's all we pray for is your will, your will, nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. And we'll praise you for it in your